Episode 17 of Outlander Cast is brought to you by the Tag You're It Etsy shop. Whether it's an Outlander inspired piece of jewelry for your favorite Sassanac or just an original jewelry creation designed by Don the owner, you can find something there for anyone. So please take the time to visit Dawn at www.tagyourit.biz. That's B I Z. Tag your mama, tag your pet, tag your it, whatever it is. She asked forgiveness and I gave it. But the truth is, I'd forgiven everything she'd done and everything she could do long before that day. For me, that was no choice. That was falling in love. Welcome to Outlander Cast with Mary and Blake. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Everyone and welcome to Outlander Cast. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name's Blake, and the world is finally, finally right again. Do tell. Well, I, I got my wife. She's back to normal. She's back in the living world. Almost. It, I mean, geez, that was that was a long way away, man. I mean, whew. guys, I could really use some Claire help. I don't I don't know if you can hear it in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna cough like every seven seconds, but yeah, I. I was like a zombie. She's pulling through it. Yeah. Not only that, I got the Red Sox back. It's opening day for baseball. The weather is out. The birds are chirping. It's a beautiful day out, right? Well, what's best is that Outlander is back. Outlander is back. And we're back. We're back having a job. I mean, we did this like once a month, you know, for the past few months. But we're back. We're back, baby. That's right. I love it. And you know what else is back? A whole bunch of new stuff. (laughs) New stuff, not just new episodes, but there's a whole bunch of new additions to the show. That's right. We're going to have some new music intros for you. We're going to have some um, really cool new uh, adaptations that we've done from Bear McCreary's music uh, to help introduce this new stuff that we got. But we also got a new rating system. A rating system. We got a rating system for the for the episodes. So you know how like some people give like four stars, five stars for you know like a good show or a good movie. Yeah, we're not giving stars. You want to know what we're giving? What are we giving? We're giving kilts. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna base this on a one to five scale. One being really terrible, and five being amazing, like really really good. So one kind of being like rent. And then five being... Oh, my God. Rent was not a one. Oh, rent was a one. It was maybe a one and a half. Okay, in your opinion. Okay, in my opinion. Okay, I'm just giving you context. And then five being the Garrison Commander. That Like that being the best episode so far, in my opinion, of Outlander. And we each get to rate because I don't agree with you all the time, right? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I don't we're, think I ever really agree with you. We're both given ratings. As a matter of fact, I encourage everybody to give ratings. Call in. Get on the social media. Tell us what you think. How many kilts? How many kilts does this show deserve? And I think that's what we're gonna what we're gonna do going forward. Okay. So five kilts being amazing, one kilt really sucking. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. I like that idea. So, do we rate the show right now? Um. Yeah. Why not? Let's All rate right. the show. What do you got for your rating? My rating would be four kilts for this episode for four the reckoning. Kilts. Four. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty high. I know. That's a high. That's a high kilt rating. It is. It is. Um. You know what really did it for me? What was the cinematography? Mm-hmm. Uh, those, Neville Kid. Oh my God. Good stuff. Yes. Just those gorgeous shots, generally of water. Like if there was water involved, I was like, Oh my God, this is beautiful. <laughs> oh, there's more water. There's another river. Gorgeous. And Bear McCreary's music. Yes. Exactly. Bear McCreary. You know. I mean, a lot of people say that he is finally starting to get into that level of Michael Giacchino or, you know, that that whole Oh, he's level. already there. No, he is well, there. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, he, he got there pretty well with BSG. Walking Dead, it, it's, it's – it's, it, the music is important to the show, but it doesn't make it. However – It makes this show. 
it totally makes this yeah. show. It, I, it, it, it's it's as much a part of the show as Scotland or the characters themselves. And I think you know, often we talk about the costumes. I don't think the costumes necessarily shown in and shined in this episode. Mm-hmm. I think the acting really, really played a huge part. But for me. It was the beauty. I think just the excitement of coming back to see the show. That was very exciting. What took away a star Mm -hmm. was the spanking scene, which we will talk about later. (laughs) If that had been handled differently, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. um, this may have been a much higher ultimate rating. How about you? How how many kilts would you rate this show? I'm giving it three and a half. Okay. We're pretty close. I'm giving it three and a half. I'm bordering three kilts. Okay. Tell me why it lost points. It lost points for the spanking scene. We'll get into that later, obviously. Oh my God. Do we agree on something? We did agree on something finally. Wow. (laughs) Just like a married couple. Who would have thunk? (laughs) But also the direction of this episode the pacing of this episode was off. It didn't. It didn't feel right to me, um, and especially during the rescue scene, it, it just you couldn't tell where you were. You couldn't tell the context of what was happening. It was dark. They were running. They didn't know where they were either. And it was just okay. They're they're on the floor, and then all of a sudden they're in the tower, and then things blow up, and blah. Like no, it, it, there there was no. It just felt jumbled to me, and I didn't like that. Okay. So because of those things, I'm giving it a three and a half kill. But rating. why did you like it? Well, why don't we? Why, let's save that. Let's let's save oh. it. Let's save it for uh, f- for the show. Okay. But before we get into the show, I wanted to say that we finally got our thousandth follower on Facebook. Yay! Who is it? And it is a fine young woman known as Alessia Abdoni. And if I'm saying your wrong and your name wrong, I am so sorry. It might be Alicia. It could be Alicia. Uh, yeah, why not? I'll go with that. Alicia Abdoni. Why not? So she is the thousandth follower on Facebook. And as we promised, we are going to give her a free Outlander soundtrack. So Alessia, Alicia, whatever your name is. We get, love you. We love you. Get in touch with us. Give us an email or Facebook us like because you're the thousandth follower on Facebook. And we'll send that out to you. Thank you all so much for those of you who do follow us on Facebook. And this is just a friendly reminder that all of our social media handles are literally just Outlander Cast. So that's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us there. We are going to jump into the episode recap, but this episode recap is brought to you by the Red Haired Lass Etsy Shop, recently featured on Nerdist.com. How cool is that? Wicked. The Red Haired Lass creates Outlander-inspired paper crafts and other assorted goods, such as the personal Craig Nadoon tree and tabletop globes. I think we need to get those for the studio. <laughs> we definitely need to get that for the studio. Sounds awesome. Luckily, we have her as a sponsor. <laughs> yes. The Red Haired Lass handmade products from our home to yours. All right, so we start off with some beautiful shots of none other than water. Water, as I said, was so gorgeous in this episode. Um, I'm just really excited to see if we get to see some more water. But Jamie is skipping stones and talking about his relationship problems. And you know, it was great, too, because the water, I think, for the whole episode, it it kept reoccurring throughout the whole episode. And I couldn't tell why. What what was the point of the water? Why why do they keep showing him? Obviously, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. But it seems like there's something... It, it seems like there's more meaning to the water than just, oh, hey, look, it's water. It's rushing waterfalls. And the way I see it, the waterfall is maybe Jamie's life kind of cascading away from him, not knowing where he's going. Not no, it, It's just going, falling down. And it's like, you know how water always finds the path of least resistance? Yeah. I think, yeah. I think Jamie's just fig- finding out like, okay, what do I do? How do I go forward? And how can I actually make my life – how can I make these choices w- without without having to bear the responsibility almost? I'm going to go with the path of least resistance. Oh, OK. What do you think? I think you're very deep. <laughs> of course I'm deep. It's me. <laughs> um, at the end of Jamie's huge – you know, monologue. He says, "When, uh, when he, this is the day he became a man." Right. When is this day? So this is what I'm a little confused at. Is so as he's skipping the stones, you actually see Leary come up. Is he saying that he became a man on the day that Leary came up to him and he made this talk and decisions with Claire later on that happened in their bedroom? Sure. Or, or is it when he, when he and Claire 
figured out that's, what they have to do going forward. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, like, do they – is a, is he a man of his customs or is he a new man trying to figure out the rest of his life with his, with his now wife, right? Yeah. So – but the other thing I really like about this, too, is now we're finally getting Jamie's point of view. It's no longer just Claire's show anymore. And it should be that way, right? Now they're married. Their, their life is one. Well, that begs a big question. Is Jamie going to be the narrator for the rest of season one? I really hope so. Or was it just this episode? Because part of me thinks that it might have been just this episode specifically to help bring about um, Jamie's perspective in the spanking scene. That's possible. Because had it been done from Claire's perspective, you would have heard a hell lot of, hell no. <laughs> Oh my God! Why did I marry this man? Get me out of here! Well, what you kind of heard that to begin with, anyway. No, but it would have it would have been a very different light, I think, had this episode t- been taken from her perspective, mm-hmm. and had we been able to brood with her, because that's the feeling you got in the books. In the in the books, it was very different. Anyway, so that's why I think that they took it from Jamie's perspective. So I don't know if the rest of the season will be from his perspective. If it is, then Outlander book fans. We're just going to be very, very excited to see that because a lot of things happened to Jamie that we didn't get to necessarily see. Well, I was going to say, I thought you were going to go the other way with this and say, I'm going to be really upset if it's Jamie for the rest of the season. No, because I already know what Claire saw. I already know <laughs> what, what she was thinking. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear all this. One of the really cool things that, I, that happened, too, was Jamie's voiceover. It is the, the first few words are verbatim. With Claire's voiceover from Sassanach, the, the first episode. In, uh, in, in Sassanach, the, 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 what she says is, strange the things you remember, the single images and feelings that stay with you down through the years. Like looking at a shop window with the sudden realization that you've never owned a vase in your entire life. Now, in this episode, in Reckoning, Jamie's voiceover says, strange the things you remember, the people, the places, the moments in time burned into your heart forever, while others fade into the mist i've always known that i've lived different a life different from other men when i was a lad i saw no path before me i simply took a step and then another ever forward ever onward rushing towards some place i knew not where how cool is that they're both talking about choices in home she is saying i want to be somewhere i need something stable in my life and jamie when he was young is saying I just lived my life. I was going out and around and I was just running. I didn't even know where I was going. I had all these different choices and I was just making them and I didn't even know what to do. But in the end, they're both coming back and saying, but I have to find something stable. Really cool stuff. And and I applaud Ron Moore and Matthew B. B. Roberts, who is the writer of this episode, who also happened to write The Gathering too in the first season, season 1A. I I give them a lot of credit for doing this. Because now, again, you're getting Jamie's point of view as if it is his story. It's not just Claire's story anymore. They share the same ideals now. Because they're married. And I know I've said this already, but it should be that way. You deserve both halves of their story. Just as you deserved Frank's side of the story in the beginning part in in season 1A. Because he and Claire are married too. I think that's the idea behind this. I wow! I didn't even think about it that way, but that's really deep. Because I'm awesome, I, obviously. That's why I married you. Wow. Okay, so getting back to the recap, we get to see Jamie with Horrocks. I don't know about you, but I really care about that stuff. I'm yeah. like, listen, we just left a big cliffhanger at the end of the first part of the season. Let's get there. So we're going to get there. Okay, let's just head on over to the fort. Um, so Jamie gets there. He does this really cool whistle thing, like. I, I can't do this it. This is in the Wild West. I can't do it. I can't. I just hit the microphone. Hey, hit the mic while you're at it, too. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, you couldn't rescue Claire, I'll tell you that. I, I would have fallen off those rocks. Well, Jamie, <laughs> along with all of his Mackenzie clan, you know, they, they storm the fort. And they don't kill anyone in the process, which blew my mind. Right. Because if I was there, I would have been freaking out. I would have been like, cut your throat, cut your throat, take your gun, (laughs) cut your throat. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe we're breaking into a fort where there are like tons and tons and tons 
of English soldiers. Right. Well, you see, the, well, one of my issues with this entire scene, I had a lot of issues with this scene, but one of my issues was there wasn't a whole lot of gods out there protecting the place. I mean, there were like four or five guys. That was it. And are you telling me a bunch of ragtag Scots are going to go over there and take over this and well, at least in capture this woman from the garrison commander's grip? They were just really lucky. That's in my opinion. Uh, They were lucky. And and this is my issue too. Here we go. BJ is a smart dude, right? He know he he knows what he's getting into, right? Why would he not have more guys posted out? I mean, he knows he has Claire. He knows he has her. And he knows that people are going to be pissed off that he has her, especially her husband. Now that she's married, he knows she he knows that she's married. He knows he's going to have angry Scots going after him. Why not have more guys out there? That doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, because honestly, it's stupid for the Scots to go and attack the fort. Just as Colm says later, like, um, who's going to clean up this mess? And Jamie knows it. He said, you know, everyone's going to be coming after us now. The British, the, 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 the English have like so much more fuel now to come after us. BGR has even more of a reason to come after me. Mm-hmm. I think BGR just kind of thought, listen, I've got this huge fort and I have a tons of people here. And if... The Scottish men are stupid enough to come here. They'll die. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just I'm not sure how I feel about it. I feel like it would have been it would have been harder for them to get into this fort. It's literally a fort. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, when you have a very special magic whistle, <laughs> it, you can do superhero things. OK, you and three friends or four friends. I think you only brought three. Yeah. Like, four dudes show up to a fort and rescue Claire. Really? You don't, you don't mess with a man's wife. I, I agree okay? with that. I agree. Think about it. Like, people talk about this superhuman strength when their loved ones are in trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, you do crazy things. That's what just happened. That, that, I agree with that. And that that's 100% true. The other thing I wonder why is, why did Ned Gowan tell them to not kill anybody? Because of what happened to Jamie. Jamie already has a huge price on his head because supposedly he killed an English soldier. Yeah, sure. But whatever. I mean, they're they're already going into this fort. They're breaking in. They're stealing Claire. They're taking her out. They're knocking BJR out. They're knocking all these dudes out. It would be a much more minor offense. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, hey, I I don't know. I mean, but I, I mean, I get it. I do get it. But I feel like they're already going to be in deep trouble as it is. Anyway, superhero Jamie doesn't kill anyone once again, knocks some guy out, takes a very rickety piece of wood and rope and is like, oh, it's totally long enough. I can. What is it when you like go off the side of a wall? When you repel? He was he was repelling. And then Claire Expert screams. Repella. Yeah. Who knew? And Claire's screaming and he gets into that window. And I loved it because for a moment he cocks his gun, but he knows there's nothing in that gun. So I thought, Jamie, why did you even take the time to cock that gun? That's for effect. Yeah. So it can have like a little, you know, <laughs> when someone does pull the trigger. I don't know. Nothing is more intimidating. I, and I, I am 100% behind this idea. Literally, there is nothing more intimidating than the, the cocking of a gun. That sound, the that that sound when you hear that you know stuff's going down. Yeah, you, like you know someone's serious. Yep. I think that's why he did it. I, I like that idea. Okay. But the other thing I like about this too, uh, and and this is the one thing I, re- I think I really liked a- about this scene. Uh, well, eventually getting into what happened with BJR and Claire and, and, and Jamie, I did like that in- it interaction. But I I really appreciated the fact that they included why and how. Jamie found Claire because in this mid-season finale, he just shows up and you're like, oh man. And that's how it is in the book. Really? He just shows up. He just happens to know where she is and he happens to know what window it's in. Come on now. But they actually gave some context and they they showed you how it got done. I like that. Yeah, they got to explain it a lot more because when you're originally reading the book, that's what you read. And that's it? They don't show you, like, how he got there Well, it's not from Jamie's perspective. He can explain okay. later. But as you're reading it, no, it's totally from Claire. So, you know, he gets in there and the whole little interaction. And Blackjack Randall said a few things in there that I'm interested to see if you picked up on. What was that? What do you got? What was he saying when he was kind of, like, holding a knife to Claire's throat and Jamie had his gun pointed at him? What did you pick up in there? Well, that he wanted to do it in front of them and he wanted Jamie to join? 
Okay. Uh, that's what I picked up on. Yeah, there's another oh, thing. Oh, why would somebody ever give their life or something to that effect to just a woman? Never mind this whore. Why anyone would pleasure themselves to a woman. Yeah. So what's that saying? What does that say, Blake? What that says to me? Yeah. The man likes dudes. Bingo. Wow. Totally never would have gotten this. Yes. Never would have gotten this. And you get this in the book because Claire talks about how he never gets um, aroused while he's trying to attempt to rape her. Then I wonder, what is it just the intimidation factor of of trying to rape her? Because he's going to rape her bum. Oh, okay. And maybe he'll, maybe he wouldn't, but um, I mean, he didn't do it. And in the books, he couldn't do it wow this is amazing so So, you know the funny thing is i did catch that but i thought like the way i interpreted it was why would anybody do this with like with a woman why would i why am i gonna waste my time with women not like oh i like dudes but like i just don't have time for women i don't have time to to just waste my time on that. So that's why he's saying, oh, Jamie, do you want to watch? Or how about, better yet, do you want to get in on this? Oh, my God. And then he's saying, I don't even know why people like girls, especially foul-mouthed girls. Like her. Yeah. Oh, my God. This adds a whole nother layer to BJ. BJ and I aren't love. you glad that I'm able to open this door to you? Because you couldn't... I, You know, we watched it twice. And the first time we saw it, I, like, casually glanced over at Blake And he didn't react. And I thought, okay, that went under the table. And then this time, same thing. And it it made me wonder how many viewers who haven't read the books, who Mm -hmm. don't know this, because Claire is very... uh, very descriptive and she's like he's not aroused he and she even says it to him she like makes fun of him she's like oh look at you you don't get aroused by me (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um i wanted to see how they kind of played this off in the show and i worried that it was a little too little of a a remark that it might be missed by many people no and you see now that is something that i can appreciate it's not in your face and it's it's not i don't think it's not that they don't want to approach that subject i think that they do why be so on the nose? You know, I, one of my complaints about the show a lot of the time is that it is so on the nose all the time. They they hold your hand throughout the show all the time. And now you're finally alluding to something, even so much so that I didn't even get it. And right. I'm, I'm the kind of viewer that wants that kind of storytelling. Yep. I like that a lot. Yeah. That's amazing. Good pick. Oh, yes. Great pick. Well, that wasn't one of your outlandish theories. I tell you what. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> so, wow. Um, One of the things that I was so shocked by was Blackjack takes the gun and fires it at Jamie. He's like, I'm going to kill you now. Boom. Mm, Except it doesn't go off. So Blackjack totally was cool with just shooting and killing Jamie right then and there. Right then and there. Yeah. You know, I think in the end, he probably just wants to kill Jamie regardless. Whether or not he wanted him to join or, or not, I think he, in the end, Jamie was dead. But one thing I do want to say about this is... It was it was almost violating seeing Claire and her being nude the way that she was. You know, and normally, I, hey, listen, I'm a guy. Am I going to be happy if I see a beautiful woman uh, nude? Yes, of course. But she was nude for so long, and the way that she was being manhandled, yeah. it was almost like, ooh, this doesn't feel right. I don't like watching this. Which is good, because that's exactly what they wanted to get across. Yes, it is supposed to be dangerous and it, uncomfortable i yeah. agree and what you another thing i noticed too was bjr asking jamie to see the damage on his back from the lash yes that he that he did to him loved that god it, bjr is a character I, I know i fawn all over this all the time but he is such a great character little nuances like that oh can i see that can i see your back or the way he asked Jamie to join in or let's get the party started or st- stuff like that. The way that he his in- interactions are with the two of them, mm-hmm. it's gold. And this is when he realizes that this is Claire's husband. He didn't know who Claire married before. Exactly. And, and, and <laughs> did you see his, like when he laughed, he's like, oh, my God, I, I can't believe it's you. Of course it's you. Why wouldn't it be you? This causes so much problems for Jamie and Claire now. Yep. Not only does he have it in for Claire, we all know that he's got it in for Claire. But now he knows that Claire is married to Jamie. Like, 
what, it's like a it's like a perfect storm. I'm, I feel like I'm going to go see Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney will come walking through here in, in, in the in the fishing boat because it's such a perfect storm for BJR. I'm just biting my tongue and book readers they're just biting their tongues with me right now. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. Um, so you know, BJR tries to shoot him, doesn't mm-hmm. work. Jamie gets the upper hand, knocks him out. Doesn't kill Black Jack Randall. Okay, why are we not killing BJR? Why because, Why is that happening? Because Ned said don't kill anybody. I know, but you and I both know that Jamie knows that BJR knows this is more personal now. Yep. This is way more personal now. He even says so. I'm telling you, man, if, I, if that had been me, I would not have played it cool. I would have been slitting throats. Even if, okay, even if they did kill BJR, right? Even if he did do it. I mean, granted, there would be no pretty, pretty much no story going forward, I, I imagine. But even if he did do it, it's not going to raise an alarm because the guy's already knocked out, right? It, it's it, no one's going to know, and they don't have th- this person coming after them anymore. So even if they kill him, who cares if if <laughs> if uh, if they kill a, a an English soldier? It just wasn't on the top of his head. You know, it wasn't on the top of his mind uh, at all. He just wanted to get the heck out I mean, of Dodge. I, I get it, but oh, God, come on, man. Kill that man. Well, probably there's this little part of Jamie, the good angel on Jamie's Well, I was just going to ask that. Is, is, is it his innocence that it provi- prevents him from killing Black Jack Randall? I think that there was definitely some of that. And he just saw it as a moment of, hurry up, let's go. And they run down the stairs, kick those soldiers in the face. The alarm goes off. Well, would you have blamed him for killing Black Jack Randall? No, you just heard me. I said I'd be cutting throats. <laughs> Great, I've never cutting throats everywhere. I don't even know how Blood to cut would be a throat. Sprawled out over over the, all the walls. Yeah, I if I was in that situation, I would do whatever I needed to do to get out of there. Mary should be on SEAL Team Six. I know. I'm like Jack Bauer, man. <laughs> <laughs> don't let me inside that fort. So Jamie and Claire get out. They kick people because that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Once again, I would have been like jugular boom. <laughs> <laughs> knife <laughs> get out of here and they're running around running in the dark and then the explosion goes off blake's favorite part Wait, what the heck is this what it's just things explode oh my god it's we need fireworks it, it it didn't make any sense whatsoever and i know that angus went ahead later on in the episode saying oh i did the gunpowder and this but it just didn't make any sense Well, it's not supposed to. I think you're taking it from Jamie's perspective, which is chaos, run, let's get out of here. An explosion went off, awesome, let's keep getting out of here. But even but even then, right? Like where they were and where they were in relation to the explosion and where they were when they were coming down the tower, it it, it just it wasn't cut, it wasn't edited properly, or it wasn't shot properly. So you just didn't know where you were. I had no physically. context. You know, like one of the things like uh, that comes up against Christopher Nolan, the guy who directed the Dark Knight movies. A lot of people say that his fight scenes were just too chaotic. That he didn't know how to place the camera. He didn't know how to shoot certain fight scenes. And I felt like that this was happening in this scene. Nobody knew like where to place the camera. So you knew where you were at all times. It just felt like they were just running and all of a sudden they were downstairs and then they were in front of the ocean and then they were going to jump. It it just I didn't like that. So you had beef with the explosion. I had beef with the jump. You ready? Oh yes, give me give it to me. <clears throat> Anyone who's gotten wet in water with clothes on knows that it's really difficult to swim with clothes on. <laughs> Did you see how much clothes those two people had on? That was a lot of clothing. And she had even her cloak. Okay, they made this huge leap of faith into the water. They would have drowned. Of course they would have drowned. You have too much heavy wool that was, you know, soaked in pee a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you are going to drown. Take off your clothes, and yet later we see them riding at dawn on their horses with all their clothing. Yeah, and where do they meet up with all their guys? You know, they, they don't have like they're not they don't have like hypothermia. They, they did their little whistle. <laughs> they did the little whistle, and they magically survived with all their heavy clothes. Well, later on, it's it's snowing later on in the episode. Are you telling me that it went from 60 degrees one from one one day to 32 degrees the next day? What made you say 60? Well, you know what I mean. It, have, it, baby, have you been here in Rhode Island? Oh, uh, what I what I'm saying is Okay, this. Scotland can have crazy weather just like Rhode Island. I, I, well, but but the thing is this. It's it's got to be cold. It's got to be the winter time, right? Yeah. And even if it is winter time, 
there's no way it's going to be 60 degrees in wintertime. We don't have 60 degree weather on Rhode Island during the winter. It doesn't the, happen. The snow didn't bother me because we just had a lovely week last week and then it snowed. But the snow doesn't bother me either. What bothers me is that it's going to be cold there regardless, especially in the morning. Yeah. And they're not suffering overnight from hypothermia. It might be just being a little too picky. No, it's okay. Okay. It's okay. That's why I had problems with the water. And I, I think you're agreeing with me to some regard. I am, actually. They wouldn't have really lasted. Okay. But, once again, Super Jamie, he goes into superhero mode to save his wife. Who knows? Maybe he was like, I have thermal underwear on. It's totally okay. I, I have a swimsuit. What are those swimsuits that surfers wear? Like wetsuit. I have a wetsuit. Here's one for you, too. What, mm-hmm. did, he get, did he get it from Nick Zappos? <laughs> of course. Overnight shipping. <laughs> He needed that stuff fast, man. One horsepower. Okay, so they're riding at dawn. Beautiful water shots once again. It was like a really cool water shot. Like the camera was actually on the water. Yeah, and it tracked over over the yeah, river. Yeah, as the horses were walking on. So mm-hmm. I really liked that. And Jamie takes Claire for a talk. And the first thing he asks her is, is she all right? Which is great. Yes. Did, did he hurt you? Is, is everything fine? It, 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 it reminds me of like, hey, is everything fine? Okay, everything's good. Now I'm going to lay into you. That's what I do when I have to talk to you about something serious. Yeah, I know. I'm like, hey, how are you doing today? Are you doing all right? Good, because we have to talk. All right? So Jamie, <laughs> little did he know, he was pulling like a serious marriage move by doing that. Mm-hmm. Checking out. Are you all right? Did he do anything to you? Okay, you're fine. Where's my apology? <laughs> I, I haven't heard it, haven't seen it. I, I don't know what's going on. Is Jamie right or wrong for asking for an apology? He's totally right. He thinks so? Yep. Why do you think he's right? Because Claire shouldn't have gone. She, shouldn't, she really shouldn't have left, um, in his opinion. Mm-hmm. And now all these guys endangered themselves. Had Claire... Gone Just, through the stones and none of this happened. Gone back to Frank, whatever. She can't apologize at that point. But he's kind of right. He told her to stay put. They're in like red coat country. Mm-hmm. It's a very dangerous world. And she, I don't, these, these few Mackenzie guys were able to save the day with an explosion that we can't fully <laughs> explain. All to save her butt. And she has no apology. She doesn't but, think she was wrong. But you can't blame her for going, though, right? No, but she can't say anything. So it's difficult because she can't even say, um, there's a reason, but I can't tell you. Yeah. She can't even do that, mm-hmm. you know? So I do. I, I think that Jamie's right to ask for an apology. I, I don't know. I mean, I think he is. I think he is right. But to ask for an apology is a little tough. For me, because you have to, you have to, dude, pick your battles. You just rescued your wife from this insane man who apparently likes dudes, which is cool. I'm fine with that. But pick your battle. You know what it's like? It's like telling someone, hey, I think your tire's flat. I think you should really check your tire. I think you should check your tire. <laughs> and then that person gets a flat tire and they're like stuck on the side of the road and then the friends have to go save them. And they're like, hey, you know, I kind of I told you so. Mm-hmm. That's what Jamie's saying right now. I kind of told you so. Well, and, well, okay. This scene, and I'm going to say this uh, out of all peace and love. This scene felt really real to me. The wording, the, the 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 dialogue was a little on the nose for me. You can't tell me what to do. You know, like, and, and uh, oh, I'm just a woman then. You know, like that to me felt a little on the nose. They they could have attacked those themes of women's rights, and they could have attacked the 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 roles between male and female, whether it's in the 40s or in the 1740s. They could have attacked that a different way. But the emotion behind the words, the way they were reacting to each other so viscerally, Mm -hmm. that felt real to me. That that felt like a married couple, someone who is just on fire. And uh, Okay, again, in all peace and love, Mary and I got into a big fight uh, however many months ago, and I forget what it was about, and... It got really ugly. Like we were just we were yelling at each other and swearing and, and going crazy. Oh, I know what it was about. Yeah. Well, what was it about? <laughs> no. Okay. What? Well, yeah, let's go. We're, we're already talking about no, it. It's okay. Continue. Yes. 
There was some foul language. There was a lot of foul language. I did my best clear uh, yes, impression. Yes, she did. You, you effing bastard! You know, like that That happened. And Mary's like, I'm getting out of here and I'm taking Reese and I'm going and I'm going somewhere. And I'm like, good, I don't care where you go. Get out of here. You know, like I was all mad. And you were saying, I was saying things that I would never, ever say to my darling wife. But I was just so freaking wrapped up in what was happening, it got out of control. I mean, like this. It just kept it was a train that just kept chugging down the road. And I and despite the fact that I didn't like the dialogue in this scene, I really felt for Jamie. I really felt for him. And 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 I can officially say that I, I'm I I think I'm on board the Jamie train because it finally shows me that he's a real man. Yeah. Yep. He's a real man. He 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 is stubborn and he's dumb a little bit too you know what i mean and he 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 gets pissed off and he and he calls her a foul mouth bitch like what jamie the perfect man says this to claire really and i i I really like that i really like the visceral nature of the conversation that they were having it felt so horrible to see to hear him call her that you know, it, it felt like, again, it felt like a violation. You're supposed to fall in love with Jamie and Claire as, as a couple. And here they are speaking to them, speaking to each other like that. Well, and that's, I think you hit the, the nail on the head. This is when you get to a very serious part in a relationship, whether it's marriage or just a relationship or even something with your family, the people that you care about the most, you can hurt the most. Oh, yeah. You know how to rip them a new one mm-hmm. like Ups no one else can. Oh, God, yeah. And then when Jamie finally sits down and he realizes that they, they both kind of crossed the line, they both said things that they shouldn't have said, he, he just sits down, he goes on the rocks. And it's just it's it's a um, it's such a desperate, desperate feeling that he has. And, and as a man, I can feel for him when he says, "I went here with Lord William under an empty pistol in my bare hands." <sighs> Why you screamed? my guts out clear. Oh, the best little line right there. It really was. Oh my god, like as a man you, you do anything for your wife. You, you I would literally travel through hell in a gas suit if I have to to make sure my wife is taken care of. And he and literally he did that. Yeah. Pretty much he did that. And here she is, and here they are fighting after this. And, and, you know, you can't really blame them for fighting that the way that they did because emotions are so high. The adrenaline is pumping. You can't th- – there's just no – there's nothing right about the situation at that very moment. They're going to go at it. But to hear how desperate and how vulnerable he, he was by just telling her, I, I did everything I could for you, and you, you're just tearing me apart inside. I don't know what to do going forward. It, it, took, it takes a big man to admit that. It takes a huge, a, a, an emotional man to admit that. I was just going to say, he is a big man. Yeah. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. What are we getting at here? I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that <laughs> member. Um, I did like that they forgave each other. And this scene, I, I don't know if I agree with you about the dialogue. I, you know, often when you do fight, it's not your most eloquent speech you know you don't have all these hidden meanings it's pretty basic when you're mad at somebody yep. and this was their first really big fight it's a really big deal really big deal to have that fight and to get over it and it's tough because they just got married so they're already fighting when they're married it's like often you get this maybe if you've been in a relationship a lot of people get into huge fights when they're engaged mm-hmm. you know and emotions are high and they're exhausted and everything and people get into really really big fights and then you learn to forgive you learn to move on and so I thought that this was huge and heck yeah Jamie huge, huge, huge in what way for forgiving Claire 
and huge and Claire, on both of their parts. Okay, a huge for their marriage, huge for their relationship. Yep. I think that this was a milestone. Whenever I talk to friends who are newly married or even engaged, um, or maybe even they're just dating and things have gotten very serious, and they get to that first really big fight, mm-hmm. they get to the thing that you were talking about where they might call each other names or they might storm out on one another and not talk for a while, and they think, "Is this over?" I say, "No, nope, it's not." This is this is your first really big test. And when you get through this test and you learn to forgive each other, you're going to open up all these doorways that you didn't even know existed because you're learning how to work with each other. Mm-hmm. And that's what Claire and Jamie had to do in this episode was learn how to work with each other. And that's why I loved that voiceover that we played at the beginning of the episode when he was saying, I, I already forgave her. forgave her. I forgave her for everything that she did and everything that she was going to do. That wasn't what it was it was falling in love and that is falling in love when you realize no matter what mary could do anything and she could piss me off to like no end and she knows well yeah i'm just talking to the listener sorry Uh. she could do anything and she knows exactly what to do to get me going but no matter what she does no matter what happens i love my wife more than anything and no matter what like no matter what you say no matter what we do nothing's ever going to change that i mean unless you run away with jamie or whatever hey. <laughs> but nothing's going to change that and that's a huge step i mean can you can we really go over this real quick for for a marriage to work you have to be able to say no matter what I forgive you. Well, let's move to the next step for a second. Okay. Because Jamie was able to forgive, mm-hmm. but the rest of the clansmen were not. No, they weren't. They mean girl there. The, this was like the Plastics 2.0. Yes. The plastics 2.0, like Scotland version. Yes. Uh, you know what this one was? This one was like never been kissed. <laughs> what, are, what are the mean people like in that one? Why are, we, why are we talking about Drew Barrymore in this podcast? <laughs> it's amazing. You know what oh, I'm talking about. When oh she like joins the cool kids and like they don't want to talk to the nerdy girl, the girl that pretends to be a piece of DNA. Oh, my God. Anyway. It, I can't believe she, we're talking poor, about this movie. Poor Claire was just trying over and over again. Hey, guys. Wanted to say thank you. Oh, yeah. That was pretty cool when you blew everyone up, Angus. <laughs> guys, can you hear me? crickets okay they were giving her serious cold shoulder and then Murtaugh pretty much tells Jamie you need to go teach your wife a lesson sure so Jamie comes up and poor Jamie here he is in the 1740s thinking whipping's a totally normal thing (laughs) he's like hey girl what's going on she's like hey you want to come to bed he's like in a minute all right (laughs) hey are you okay Oh, good. Because guess what? <laughs> All right. So, um, hope you had a really good dinner, and this shouldn't take too long. Belt unbuckling. <laughs> we got to figure some stuff out. Okay. Tell me how you would react. To what? If you took off your belt? No, 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 no. If you were in 1743 Scotland, and Jamie's sitting right in front of you, the, the big hunk of a man that he is, and he starts on doing his belt saying, we got to figure some stuff out, girl. Okay, am I a time traveler who knows that this is not okay? You are in Claire's position. Oh, oh, man. (laughs) What do you do? Do you do exactly what Claire does? Exactly, except I would have once again gone for the jugular (laughs) and then balls. Like, why go for his face? No, kick him in the balls. (laughs) What? Claire, you should know this. I'm never going to unbuckle my belt in front of you. (laughs) No, because I know what to do. I watched those, like... Protect yourself. You're a woman walking through the parking lot videos. What? Oprah. Oprah used to show these videos like how to protect yourself. I know. Claire did not get to see those videos. So, yeah, I mean, okay, let's let's talk about this scene. Hopefully not too much because, as I said, this is what brought it down a star for me. Not a star, a kilt for me. And this is also what was hard for you. Um, This scene is tough because we are not from 1743. Correct. We do not come from this background. Um, We come from a time when domestic assault and domestic abuse is incredibly wrong. Yeah, you wouldn't – I would never think to lay a hand on a woman ever. And it's something that we're taught as a society right now to stand up against Mm -hmm. and to feel badly about and to feel strongly about. So when I read this in the book, I didn't forgive Jamie until the end of this book. And this happens pretty early on in the book. Oh, wow, really? Um, 
Yeah, this this really struck a chord with me, and I held it against Jamie personally a heck of a lot longer than Claire did. Well, can you really hold it against him? Because he, no matter what, he is a man of his time. I mean, this is how he grew up. It, it, it's how he understands things. And as much as I don't agree with it, I can't, I can't fault him for it because it's his tradition. It, he said himself, from his father to his grandfather to his grandfather, that's how they handle things. And that's why this particular episode had to be said from his perspective. Because I, had I agree it been with said that. from Claire's, um, you know, I don't think she's ever been afraid of Jamie. And he's always said, you know, you don't need to be afraid when you're around me. And yet here is this massive man trying to grab her so he can hit her mm-hmm. with his belt, doing everything within his power to grab her. Mm-hmm. And she's fighting against him with all of her might. It would have been very, very scary. I think scary is the right word. It would have been very scary had this episode been spoken from Claire's perspective. I think this... Okay, so we, we've already mentioned that the spanking scene took it down a notch. So let's get into why it took it down a notch for us. At least for me... It was played off as though it was funny. Yeah. You know? And, and to me, that that doesn't work for me. Because even though I don't blame Jamie for what he was doing, I, I can't fault him because that's what he grew up knowing and, and being a part of. That's his lifestyle. It's still supposed to be dangerous. It almost reminds me of Fifty Shades of Grey because we went out and saw that movie. And I remember you read the book and you ended up telling me that – the sex scenes, even though that they were these really hot, steamy scenes in Fifty Shades of Grey, they were dangerous. There was a level of danger that the girl, Anastasia, went through during them. And even though she was kind of turned on, she was scared. And I, and even though I knew Claire was scared and she was angry and she was like, no, F you, you're not going to hit me. The fact that they played it off like it was funny. And they had like the, the the fiddle going, and they were they were cutting back and forth between Dougal and Angus and and Rupert and and Murtaugh. It took away from the violation that was happening between Jamie and Claire. And you know, it must have been such a hard choice for Ron Moore. Um, I was reading because this scene bothered me so much. I read up a lot about it, and <clears throat> at the New York premiere, the crowd actually laughed a lot and clapped during the scenes, and. That was not what Ron expected. That was not what the cast expected. It's not at all what they went for. And they they still struggle with why is that the reaction? Why are people laughing? Why are people clapping? Is it because it's such an important scene? Um, we, we now, at the end of the episode, you know, Jamie and Claire come to this realization that it's not going to ever enter their marriage again, that they are going to respect each other and never uh, hurt each other like that. But um, it really kind of threw them for a loop because they didn't know why people acted that way. And I read about how Ron worked really carefully with Bear McCreary on the music for this scene. Yep. Because I was watching it the second time and I thought, okay, if I was playing serious music or if I didn't play any music at all, how scary would this scene come See, off? now, that's the, that's the thing. It should have been no music whatsoever. And Ron said he actually sat down with women and he had them watch it without music mm-hmm. or had the music come in later. Mm-hmm. And it was too scary for them, and they were um, they had a really hard time with Jamie. And 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 it, but you see, that's the point, in my opinion. But if it's taken, if this episode is from Jamie's perspective, that's where it's tough. If this episode is from Jamie's perspective, Jamie doesn't view what he's doing as scary. Okay, I see. I see what you're evil. getting at. I see what you're getting at. And and now that you say it like that, it, it does make more sense. Yeah. That since it's from Jamie's perspective. It's more of it's 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 not like meant to be mean. It's not meant to be horrible. It's just meant to be like, okay. But what's hard is that you don't have Ron Moore saying this in the beginning of the episode. I I learned this because I read this and I, I was so intrigued and wondering why the heck was that music so upbeat? Why was it almost fun music? And some of the reactions that I read online – talked about Fifty Shades of Grey. Some people were like, who needs Fifty Shades of Grey? We now have Fifty Shades of Outlander. (laughs) And I don't like that. Neither do I, because it's not meant to be that. And once again, you know, here we are in this society where it's almost glorifying domestic assault. Well, I wouldn't go that far. No. Fifty Shades of Grey... 
the girl at least is kind of asking for it. Fifty, this Outlander, she was not asking for it, and she was saying no. Yeah, but I don't think it, want I don't think it glorifies it. As a matter of fact, I think they go out of their way in the episode to. No, I'm saying the fans, the fans that are saying this. I don't oh, think okay, it's. Okay, I don't think right. it's Ron's fault. I don't think it's Bear's fault. I don't think it's the actors. What concerns me is is the reactions from other people. I I often read a lot of different people saying things like every wife needs a good spank. Yeah, and things like that is um, are what what made me bring this down because it's so hard. I don't think Ron could have done it any better or different. Um, See, I think he could have. I, I think, you know, again, you're getting into this idea of, okay, is it Claire's story or is it Jamie's story? And I go back and forth on this because it's both of their stories. Now, even though Jamie doesn't think of it as malicious, he doesn't think of it as like, oh my God, this is domestic abuse. It's awful. It still is regardless. And when you have this scene being played out, having this kind of happy music, it takes away from the danger. And it takes away, okay, even if it is Jamie's story, it takes away from him realizing this is bad news. This is bad news. I shouldn't do this. I effed up big time. He gets it by the end of the episode. He, to and that's some what I'm saying. Degree. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But he, it, it, in order for him to make a good transition from knowing that this was stupid to this is my wife and we don't operate like this, you, you can't have it be funny. You, you, just, you just can't. I, I, I cannot find a way to legitimize this being funny in any way. And, and, it, yeah. and I and also I also can't blame the the crowd over in New York for clapping or or um, laughing during this scene because it's the way that it's written and the way that it's the way that it's cut. It, it's supposed to be funny. The way that it seems, it's supposed to be more light. Yeah, and I and, don't think it was meant to be funny. I think it was meant to be light. Okay, and even then, it might have been nervous laughter. You know what I mean? Because. You know how when you get into a situation and you you just, okay, what do I do? So I just laugh. I don't know what to do. It uh, might have been nervous laughter too. If it's anything like these comments that I've been reading. I don't know. Anyway, the guys downstairs hear all of this going on. Dougal says it's Jamie's duty and that she won't make that mistake again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, of course, Claire comes downstairs afterwards and gets herself some porridge and pouts in the corner because she can't sit. Her bum hurts too much after all that spanking. <laughs> and the guys kind of like laugh at her. Whatever. Bullies. Once again, never been kissed. <laughs> okay. Now we're at Castle Leoc. Yes. Finally. The, the triumphant return. And triumphant it was. Yes. The, Open those doors and you have mad Claire with a sore bum. She just had to ride a horse. That whole long way. I didn't even think about that. Oh, I did. <laughs> I did. Oh, oh, my gosh. I would want some ice packs under there, some like aloe vera gel. I don't even know. <laughs> so she comes in. Everyone's cheering. Very excited. Congrats to you both. Call them walks in. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my uh, uh, autocorrect hates Colm's name. Really? Because I take notes on my iPad. Mm -hmm. Usually it puts in Colin. But for this particular part, it called him Columbus. <laughs> I put Columbus is super quiet and awkward. <laughs> no, Columbus was not there. He was a few hundred years before. <laughs> He'd already lived and died. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, the, the look of disappointment on Colum's face. Yeah. It, was, it was telling. And, and it was the way that he was like, oh, congratulations to you and yada, yada. It was almost said like. But he just says it to Claire. He yeah. congratulates only Claire. Sure. Exactly. But it's almost like F you congratulate. Like it's almost like a it's a backhanded compliment in my opinion. It's like when my mom tells me that something's very interesting. <laughs> my mom told me this code word, guys. She told me that sometimes when she talks with, with people that she works with and she doesn't really like what they say, she goes, Hmm, interesting. In interesting she, she forgot that she told me this code word. So Occasionally, we have conversations where I'll be like, oh, mom, you know, Blake and I are doing this, or we're thinking about planning a trip, or we're having a baby. Interesting. Interesting, Mary. And I'm like, shoot. <laughs> I know what that means. What did I do wrong? My mom's giving me the column treatment. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, we're going to skip forward to leg hair, otherwise known as Leary. But if you haven't read the books, 
the way they spend that Diana spells Leary is it looks like leg hair. It's, it's, it's exactly leg hair. It's amazing. Anyway, she tells Jamie that she waited for him. Now, Jamie looks very kindly at her. And, and I, if I were Jamie, I would have looked at her and been like, we waited for what? We kissed. We like made out once. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was drunk. <laughs> what are you doing? And you see, this is the thing. Jamie isn't owning his actions here. He's not telling her, listen. I'm married now, and I love my wife. He leads her on. He's oh, like, oh he, yeah, we're gonna talk. He touches her shoulder. Yeah, like what are we talking about here? Why? Why would you? What makes you? Th- what? What? In what world is this okay? And he doesn't say I'm happy with my marriage because he isn't. He just had to spank his wife, and she's not, you know, doing her. But whatever. He he doesn't even say I'm I'm happily married to my wife. He says it was Dougal's doing. Yep. Blames it on Dougal and touches her shoulder. Now, let me tell you guys, when Blake and I got serious, I had to lay the law down. I said, listen, Blake, it's not that I don't trust you. It's that I don't trust other women. Mm -hmm. And if you touch a woman and she's vulnerable or giving her like heartbreak story to you and you do a little comforting thing, she's going to take it and run with it. Of course she is. So hands off. And at first you were like, Oh my God, what do you mean? I said, don't you dare comfort women when they have male problems or they're lonely and they want a man, any of this kind of stuff. Once you are taken, (laughs) nope, 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 nope. You walk away. And this is exactly what Larry's doing. And poor Jamie didn't have this conversation. He fell into the trap too. Touches her freaking shoulder. What are you thinking, bro? He's not. He's not. He's Uh, clearly not an experienced married man. He's a weasel. And that's exactly what Colin calls him. A weasel. He's yeah. not a weasel. He, no, He's no. not a weasel. I, I'm it's, kidding. It's what he did was weaselish. You know, it was naive. It was just naive. It but, wasn't weaselish. But he didn't own his actions. I just wanted to throw in the word weasel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it totally back. It's he doesn't even know. Jamie is so young. Jamie is really a young man. He's he was a virgin before he was with Claire. He I don't even know like his serious relationship nature, if any. I mean, he's been on the road with guys all the time. Sure. So he doesn't know. And here he is. Here's Leary. And she's upset. And he doesn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. He can't even kill Black Jack Randall. And this goes back to my whole idea about the water and the path of least resistance type deal. He's not taking it. He's not taking ownership. Just tell the girl, hey, man, I'm married. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you that you're upset. And I'm sorry that things are happening the way that, you know, you don't want them to happen. But, hey. I, I, I got to own it. I'm married now. And no, we're not going to talk. And no, we're not going to show up in the middle of some river while I'm skipping rocks looking all sexy because you're not worth it to me. You're not worth my time. You're not going to put any of this stuff in danger for me. Let's talk about that river scene. Let's fast forward a little bit. We'll come back to We'll come back to the weasels. weasels. Okay. <laughs> God, that's a good band name. Oh Call them in the weasels. Be. They were like an Outlander inspired band. <laughs> Call them in the Call weasels. Them weasels. It's a, it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, Harry and the Potters. Oh, such a good wizard rock band. Yes. The wizard Harry. Oh, look at you. You did it. I did it. You did it this time. No. Um, okay, so there's you know Jamie skipping his rocks, doing his thing. And Leary comes up and she's like, oh, this has been your secret hiding place forever okay how long have you been stalking jamie <laughs> what is going on once again he Why made out with you this? once in a when he was drunk it's like poison ivy that movie oh it's another drew barrymore movie what are we doing with drew barrymore today <laughs> oh my god where is leary's undershirt oh my god she forgot a step in her clothing boobs were going all over the place okay let's talk about the boobs because she will you know let's jamie touch her boob Mm -hmm. he doesn't take his hand off no he doesn't even when he's saying no Mm -hmm. his hand kind of lingered there for a while he's like oh no no that that sucks no i don't want to do that (laughs) grab 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 no it sucks grab 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 and she you know i i just get your hand off of her (laughs) get your hand off of leary weaselish oh no that's weasely Come okay, on now. Okay, keeping his hand on her boob. That's weasel. That was a little weasel. Thank you. I would agree. Thank you. I would agree. Jamie, you're dumb. You're dumb right here, okay? <laughs> but this again, this is why I can actually finally get behind Jamie, not because I approve of his of what he's doing, but because at least this is showing he's real. He he's not yeah. some statue. He's not a, he's not the guy that's in the Leonardo da Vinci 
painting of the perfect man, you know, with it with with the circle. Which is around what you've him. been saying he's been coming off as. Of course, he has been coming off as this. Okay. You know, it, he's finally not that, and damn it, that's awesome. Finally, like he's a real man. He's, a, he's something that I can get behind. He now. tells Leary that he made a vow and he's not going to break it, even for a lass as bonny as you. Now he compliments her. Pretty much while his hand is still on her boob. I think his hand might have come off by that point. But it's like, Jeannie, you don't tell a woman, sorry, I don't want to be with you, I'm married, while you've touched her boob and you're saying that she's hot. Like, that is mixed signals. Okay, if I was Leary, who'd been obsessed with him since I was seven, stalking him in a skipping rock place, and he kept his hand on my boob, and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm married, touch boob, Um, but you're really hot. <laughs> I would have a little bit of mixed signals, too. I might make a little voodoo uh, stick thing for the odd chance that it might happen again. Oh, Okay? God. Don't lead her on. I love you so much. It's true. Oh. Take your hand off of her. Touch boob. <laughs> and you're hot. Okay, we'll go back to the weasels. Oh, Column and the weasels. This is great. I love this name. Column calls Ned, Dougal, and Jamie. All Weasels. together. <laughs> just for what they, they're doing. And it was great because he's just waiting for them to step in it. He's waiting for them to be like, okay, guys, who's going to answer for all of this? Who's the one who decided to do this? And will we, the Mackenzie clan, have to deal with the repercussions of this? AKA that wonderful explosion. Yeah. <laughs> That didn't make any sense. No. Um, <laughs> oh, and by the way, what's this money I hear you're raising for the Jacobite army that I don't approve of? Yeah. Okay. What, um, like you, most of you guys know, I, I work with my family, and um, my dad is my boss. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. Uh, it's, it can be great, and it can really suck bad. So a couple of weeks ago, there was a situation where we we had to make some decisions and my father wasn't consulted because for ex- extraneous reasons, doesn't really matter. When he comes back and he comes back from vacation, he comes home and he, and he sees some, some of the decisions that we made and he's like, why didn't anybody consult me? And, you chose Polly. Yeah, I know. And he said, why do I have to pay for decisions that aren't mine? You guys are doing this without my knowledge. And I have to answer for it. I'm the one that has to answer to, to, the, to the people that we have to answer to. Not you. You're not responsible. I am. So I really felt for Colum in this situation because here he's got these guys making decisions without him, doing the things that they got to do without him, yet he's the one who's in, who's in charge. He's losing control of his own clan. And I felt terrible for him. I didn't I didn't I don't blame him for going nasty on those guys, especially Jamie too. Yeah. I don't blame him. Now, I mean for him to assume that Jamie was part of the ruse or, or part of the He was mad at Jamie because of the Ford. That's what he had two different issues he had to work sure, on. Sure, yeah, yeah. And and but and, and then the whole gold thing. It, it, it's another situation where who in the world says it's okay for you to go collect money to support Bonnie Prince Charlie? This is still my clan. It's under my rule, and I am the one who decides who and what we support. Dougal, go F yourself, and don't ever come back here thinking that you can make the decisions on who gets this money. It's my money. And little did he know that by pretty much flexing his muscles, what little muscles poor Column has, um, he was going to piss off Dougal. And Dougal was like, oh, yeah? Well, I fight your army battles, and I raise your money. Oh, and I assured your blood dr- bloodline. Mic drop. Boom. See, I told you he wasn't, uh, Hamish wasn't uh, Column's kid. That was totally Dougal's kid. I called it from the beginning. Well, good job. That was an outlandish theory of the week made true. Ta-ting! Yeah, girl. You and Claire both get a sticker this week, okay? Your theories came true. Bam. Right there. Like that. Just like that. In my notes, it says, Columbus is so mad. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Colum, of course. Not Columbus. Stupid autocorrect. Columbus. (laughs) Oh, unbelievable. In addition to this, he's so upset with Jamie because not only has all this stuff gone down at the fort, Mm -hmm. but he's married an Englishwoman. 
Oh, my God. And who saw this coming? Colum wanting Jamie to be the new Laird. Who? I mean, I, I always had an idea that Jamie was going to be the new Laird uh, some way or somehow. Like, it, it seemed as though it was going down that track, especially during the fealty speech when, when both Colum and Jamie were walking. I'm sorry. When both Dougal and Jamie were walking up to Colum at the same time. It felt like, okay, this is this is going to be a deal that's going down. And it felt like they were both going to be the Laird, or they were going to vie for it. But who knew that Colum wanted Jamie to succeed him? And with that in mind, it doesn't feel right what's happening in this episode between Colum and Jamie. It, it it seems like Jamie is like a personal advisor almost to call him. Like when, when Jamie's talking about uh, Dougal saying, oh, let, let him play the rebel. Let him do all this. Let him do that. He'll be fine. And we'll it, – it's all about peace. And Colm's like listening to this guy. From the, from the way that the, the show was written in season 1A, Jamie's a stable boy. He's not taking oaths and he's not inside these conversations. He's going working with horses. When all of a sudden did he become this special advisor? He's working with the horses right now because he's outlawed. Yeah, but because there's a bounty on He is Colum's nephew. He's Colum's sister, who Colum loves, mm-hmm. son. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got a smart head on his shoulders. And yeah, I, I agree. But at least in terms of the way that the show was written, it just doesn't seem. Like if if you had seen a, a, a previous scene of Jamie talking to Colum in a manner like this at Castle Leoc before they took off to go get rent, it would make sense. Well, I think if you put like Jamie next to someone with the intelligence of say Angus, mm-hmm. you know, Colum doesn't really have that many bright people around him. I would agree. And with the that. ones that he did, he now doesn't trust because they're weasels. Yep, I agree. So here he is being open and honest with Jamie. And he is able to share, hey, I kind of had this hope that you could possibly be Laird. Well, the way that they talked about it, it was almost as if Jamie knew in advance. You know, It was almost like Jamie knew Colm's plan before any of this went down. Because it wasn't – you didn't see shock on Jamie's face. You didn't see like, oh my god, like really? You, that's what you wanted? It was it, – Jamie was like, I know, but I, I didn't mean it to be like that. It just, it just kind of happened. So it it, 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 it it alludes to the fact that Jamie already knew. And if that's the case, it seems like it's out of left field almost. Well, I think you also need to remember that Colm is very ill mm-hmm. um, because he does have a son, but that son is very young. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they don't highlight it that frequently. But Colm, I think, always has in the back of his mind, I might not be here for much longer mm-hmm. and I need to – Figure this out while I still can. And here's and here's the bigger question: Did Dougal know of this plan beforehand, before having Jamie get married to Claire? Did he purposely do it? I mean, I know we talked about this last season. Did he purposely do it to ensure the fact that nobody would be on board with Jamie being the Laird? Dougal. Looks out for Dougal. I yeah. will say that. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. And, and, and I had a feeling at the time that Dougal was setting all this up just to screw with Jamie. Just to put him in a position that was weaker than what he had. Dougal doesn't have anyone's back but his own. Oh, yeah. I will say that. Well, well let's, stay, let's stay on this. I mean, Jamie is the one that is able to help convince Colm that peace is the right idea. Mm-hmm. And from that, it's like this little light bulb goes off in his head where he's like... Whoa, compromise. <laughs> wow, how do you say that in Gaelic? <laughs> I don't even know. I should try it with my wife. Yeah, I agree. You know, and, and he's a better man for it. He's a better man for it. But before we get into that, I, and I just want to say this real quick. The politics here about the Jacobite Revolution and now the split between the Mackenzies and the Frasers, it happened very quickly. It, it's almost as if that stuff was already underlying in what's happening. You know what I mean? It, it was almost already there. I think it's just to show you that, that tensions, like emotions are really tense. Mm-hmm. Um, 
for them to be like, oh, are you on the McKenzie side? Are you on the Fraser side? They're just trying to figure things out and everyone's really tense and the storm is brewing. That's what you need to get out of this. Yeah. Is that the Jacobite storm is brewing. Nobody really knows where everyone stands and they're not allowed to really say it out loud and proclaim it from the hills because then they'll be traitors, mm-hmm. which is what Colm's saying. He's like, listen, buddy, I'm not going to bring any kind of ill will against my the people I'm in charge of yet. Yep. So it's I don't think it's anything that you need to think about Fraser versus Mackenzie yet. Well, but the way that they're writing it, it, it appears that way because even Rupert was like, you know, and this is Mackenzie business. I think you phrases should get out of here and, and take a hike, seriously. That was him being a bully. That was him saying like, can't sit here. <laughs> it, it wasn't It wasn't really that much deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, they're two different families. But um, it's not the depth of the Jacobite kind okay. of topic. But it's it, just... you still have that divide between Colum and Dougal, you know, the chief and the war chief. Yeah. Which one are you going to follow here? And it seems like this is a much bigger, even though Colum gives the money back, it seems like this is going to be something that's much bigger later on down the road. It seems like there's there's going to, it's going to come to a head sometime soon. And there's going to have to be an answer somehow. And I wonder what what's it going to be what what is this conflict between Dougal and Colm going to come to is it going to put Claire and Jamie in the middle and how do how do they maneuver themselves in and out of that circumstance well let's leave it at that and talk about the maneuvering that Claire and Jamie did oh good carpet. transition oh, hey bring it so <laughs> of course Jamie comes back and makes that vow to Claire the same vow, pretty much, that he made to Colm. Which was so innocent of well, him. Well, he didn't do it, but other people were doing it. Mean, it was so innocent of him being like, I don't know what to do. I always have known what to do, and I just have to figure something out now. And he goes back to the one thing that he knows, which is fealty and doing this pledge with a sword. And none of that crap ma- it matters to, to Claire at all, in my opinion. Really? What, yeah, no, I mean, like, it, I mean, I th- I'm sure it's heartwarming. I'm sure it's like, oh, look at him. He's so cute. But th- that's not what Claire needs. What Claire needs is someone that's more modern. It's not, oh, uh, give me this sword, and if it, if it, if it, if I ever do that to you again, and plunge it through my chest, and it, that doesn't impress Claire, in my opinion. Oh, I thought it did. Really? Oh, she dropped her shoulder. No, her no, no, no. Wait a second. Hold very on. Very quickly and, after and, that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue this point because even he, even Jamie, was like, "What? It? You don't want me anymore? Like that? That wasn't enough? No. This is, this is what made her want him back. because oh. he had come in before, and she didn't want him. Yes. And then once he did this fealty pledge, then they kind of forgave each other. And she was like, oh, look at my shoulder. Oh, my, there's my boob. <laughs> and Blake and I rewound and rewound and rewound this part of the scene. Blake thinks that Jamie whispers into Claire's hair, I love you so much. Yeah, I can't breathe. And I think he says, I want you so much. Because I don't think they've said out loud to each other, I love you yet. I don't think that they have i went back to that scene thinking that that was the first time now if we, they have said that i love you to each other then we're 100 percent wrong and i'm sorry for that but i think you're right sweetheart i don't think i've heard any of them oh i don't think i've ever heard i love you out of them no i don't think it's happened outside of their little mono like inside their heads <laughs> <laughs> so uh he tells claire that she's his home now um, and then you talked about the key to Lolly Brock. Now, see, now that to me is what got Claire's pants all in a tizzle. She wasn't even wearing pants. You know what I mean. I got her undies. She was fall under the ground. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is, her shift on fire. That to me was, you're my home now. That was what got her going. And oh. you see, now I think that's the case because that is what would have gotten me going. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that is what Claire looks for. She couldn't get that from Frank. And as much as I love Frank, he didn't have those. He didn't have that those words for her, whereas I think Jamie does. So they start to um, have sexual relations. Ooh, this was a good like three minute long sex scene, by the way. They took off their clothes very quickly. Oh. Um, it was very rough, and then Claire all of a sudden took a knife to Jamie's throat. I think we should use knives in bed more often, by the way. I don't use them ever, and <laughs> no thank you. Unless they're to cut cake that I can eat while I'm in bed. Because I like cake. Especially in bed. 
Oh, crumbs. Never mind. I changed my mind. <laughs> anyway, she, you know, she's holding the knife to his throat while she's thrusting him. Or he's, thr- I don't even know. There was lots of thrusting there, going there's on. There's just no easy way to say it. No, there isn't. And she tells him that if he ever were to hit her again, she would cut out his heart. And eat it for breakfast. Now, what what a great scene! I mean, and not only are they they having sex, it's like makeup sex. You know, like that's the best kind of sex. And sh- they're having sex, and it's love, it's passionate, and it's the one, it's the ultimate binding thing that they have. But while they're in this bound nature, she's threatening his life. She's creating life and and threatening life all in the same. Instance And yet it's two very different things. So, of course, he did the spanking on her bum, you mm-hmm. know, very raw, very naked feeling. Mm-hmm. And now they're actually having sex, mm-hmm. doing the complete opposite. Mm-hmm. And she's telling him, if you ever do that to me again, while she's holding a knife to his throat. That's yeah. a little scary. It was very acute. You know, it was very pointed. And I, I, I know that's on the nose a little bit, but it was it was exceptional how they wrote it it was almost a little uncomfortable watching them have sex and having her point this thing at him i was uncomfortable i was so uncomfortable you gotta be careful the you're thrusting of, the amount of boobs that was shown in this episode it was the boob counts going crazy <laughs> but it, it was it was uncomfortable but it was supposed to be i think um it was supposed to be loving it was supposed to be passionate it was supposed to be raw and i i think it achieved that. It achieved the nature of life versus death and the threat of death. And that's what Claire had to get across because that's what they can bond over. Ultimately, they bond over with each other over sex and how better to get that message across and how serious that message is than while they're having sex. Once they switched positions and she was on the rug, Mm -hmm. I was like, oh no, she's going to get rug burn on her back. (laughs) I couldn't. I, I was nervous for her, and it was great because it was both of the. It was both their personalities, Claire on top, and then all of a sudden, as she gave way to the fact that they had finally resolved their issue, even though it was done by threat of knife, she gave way to Jamie to allow him to do what he does, and even jokingly later called him master. Yeah, which was great. They had some fun little banter. She told him what fucking meant and what being a sadist meant and then she found this really cool thing under the bed called an ill wish <laughs> has anybody you, you haven't seen true detective yet no no if anybody's seen true detective those little ill wishes are everywhere it's like the same exact design oh, i'm so scared it's crazy I, I was like oh my god did they get that from like from hbo really <laughs> Ew, no. <laughs> so of course she's sitting there saying who in the world would want to bring pain harm or death and then very specific suspensefully lady <laughs> and what it should have shown was his hand on her boob saying, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> it's your own fault, Jamie. Well, you know what the funny thing is? Getting getting back to Leary, you know how she he put her hand, his hand on her boob? She put it right there, but you then know, he kept you know, it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Okay, yeah. great. He did the same exact thing to Claire. Uh-oh. Or, or she, he had Claire do the same exact thing to him. Hand on the heart over the same over the same thing. The same day, did he do? Did he touch two girls' boobs in one day? Of course he did. Oh, Jamie, wash your hands. (laughs) Wash your hands. Oh, so yeah, that's the episode, guys. That's a three and a half kilt episode for me. Four, in my opinion. Oh my god! All right, what do you say we get into the listener feedback? First up, we have some emails. How about the one from Allie, Blake? We got one from Allie, and she was saying, I'm not going to try to convince you, Blake, that Claire and Jamie are a better match, even though they are. But I'll say this one thing. Even if Frank and Claire's personalities and interests were compatible, Jamie has a big advantage on Frank. Jamie and Claire are going through a lot together, and that's one of the reasons why their bond is so strong. Facing these terrible things together. Yes, Frank and Claire lived through a war. They lived through the terrible circumstances, too, but not together discussions of true love and such aside that makes all a difference in my opinion claire is bound to feel closer to jamie very quickly it's like the movie speed <laughs> romantic relationships out of intense situations right isn't that the whole thing doesn't the guy say like oh is this gonna work <laughs> what? 
it. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Speed? I know exactly. Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock. Don't they, you- don't they actually have a conversation saying like, wow, romantic relationships when crazy things happen? I don't remember that scene. I'm not going to lie. Maybe maybe that was me dreaming it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Never mind. Can you, just, you delete this? No, I'm not deleting. I'm keeping it all in. Shoot. You know, and and and, and Allie, I think you're right. I, no, they totally talk about it at the very end of the movie. They totally talk about it when they like at the end. They're like, "Oh, I don't know if relationships work when in, in situations like this." Anyway, continue. <laughs> I, they totally say it between never been kissed and speed and poison ivy. We can't make any more random movie references. Yes, uh, Allie, I I agree and I get it. They they're going through a lot together. They're doing what they got to do with each other. It makes sense. But, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. I will admit that maybe Jamie and Claire can get closer together because they 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 are going through this crap together. I think that's definitely possible. But, I don't know. I just love Frank. I know, but you just said this time, now you're able to see a human side of Jamie. She also said something else, too. Yeah, she said that in the Rent podcast that we did, Blake, you said that Claire was stupid for telling Ned the Jacobites were going to lose against the English because that's exactly what an English spy would say. And 10 minutes later, you wondered if she was going to change history. Well, which is it? Well, both. Both. Are you telling me that it's smart to go tell somebody that you're going to lose? Of course it's stupid Wait, when you're just a Sassanok, just showing up in this place and you're, and you're, you're going to lose this war. She is capable of telling them that, that that she is capable of being stupid for saying something and also trying to change history. Can she do it? Is it territory that Ron Moore can can mine? Yeah, I think so. But I don't agree with it. I don't think I don't agree with her trying to change history. It's not her position. It's not her regardless of the reason why she went back there whether it was God or science or the fates or whatever you want to call it, call it. It's not her position to change history. Her position is to simply exist and do what she has to do in that life. I don't, I don't agree with her trying to do that. We had a lot of feedback on Twitter this week. Amanda Lee Nelson says, Whoa, if I fought with my ex like that, we'd be married today. <laughs> Beautifully done. <laughs> uh, wow. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, girl, you know, you have that kind of sex after a fight, that would make you... Wow. Yeah, it'd make you anyway, want to be with the guy. Vicky at VMR said they're freezing her out. Highlanders meets mean girls. That's exactly it, Vicky. Those Highlanders are mean. Deanna Hervey says, did Jamie really think he could jump back in the sack after he tanned her arse? Men. <laughs> I love that scene when he's like getting undressed and she's like, oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Not, no. no. <laughs> think again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> She put on the Beyonce, to the left, to the left, everything in yours in a box, to the left. She was like, you can't even get in this bed. Anyway, Crystal Schlossbinger said that it was the hottest sex scene yet. And you know what? It was pretty, pretty rocking. It was rocking. I, I liked it in, in it, it, well, hot and, and loving are two different ways. So yeah, I, I would say hot, hottest sex scene yet, definitely. Yolando at Red Hawkins says, leg hair, we've all been waiting for Jamie. To the back of the line with you. <laughs> Poor leg hair. <laughs> she, Poor Leary. She's got nothing going on with her life. Calico Rose. Oh, look. Outlander is on again. I'll, I still have tea, biscuits, and cheese. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> At Magara Yusu says, my mother is probably the only person in the world who prefers Frank to Jamie. Um, what? Uh... First of all, no, your mother's not the only person. Uh, I'm that person, too. So hey, speaking of all that, by the way, do you think, Frank, do you think we're done with him for the rest of the season, or do you think we're going to see him again? I'm not going to tell you. You're not going to tell me? I'm not going to tell you, Blake. I would think it would be disingenuous to not see Frank. Okay, well, that's your theory. Okay, well, I mean, it's not my outlandish theory. No, but I'm just, I, you know, it's so hard for me to shut my mouth with you. <laughs> Don't ask me questions. I think we're going to see Frank again because... Again, like I said with Jamie and Claire, they're married. He is as much part of the story as as Claire is. They're one unit now. When you're married, you are one singular unit. You cannot negate that. It, it just doesn't happen. Okay. I don't know. What, what do you got for Facebook, kid? Ellen Kalnan said it was a fabulous episode. Sam Hewen really came into his own in this episode, in particular the scene with Leary next to him. He was a 24-year-old, was a virgin until just a few days ago. Will my wife hate me forever? 
for the love of that is all oh, holy boobs right here i can have them <laughs> boy in that scene right in front of us pushed that aside masterful acting i agree ellen because you're right here he was he 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 gets these boobs right in front of him. He now knows what sex is. His wife's really mad at him. You know. It's it's tempting. It's tempting for a guy that young to be like, hmm, this girl wants me to, and maybe, I've kind of had her before. Maybe I'll just put my hand right there. <laughs> and I'll just hold it. Okay. It's just, you know, one more. Trudy Minor says, I thought it was the best episode yet. The argument by the Glen was true to life. They looked really angry. The scene with the three weasels was very enlightening. It really sets the stage for later on. And the Jacobite re- Rebellion and the sibling rivalry between Column and Dougal. Jamie's spanking scene was interesting. I thought Claire was suitably outraged when he did it, as this was something that wasn't done in the 20th century. I loved how Jamie tried to heal the breach with Claire afterwards. It was heartfelt, if not misplaced. April Estep said, I know some fans don't like when the show strays from the books, but I like it. Also, Leary was a bit of a whore in this episode. <laughs> whore. I, ch- <laughs> I can't do it very well. <laughs> It'll make me cough. <laughs> it makes her dislike of Claire so much more dangerous and believable. Marissa Mia Della Rosa Sutton says, I loved the twist of Colin wanting to name Jamie as his, as his successor. Just what exactly does Colin think of Dougal that he does not think he should be the next Laird? I agree. I, I, I mean, what, what, what does Colin think of Dougal? Does he really dislike him that much? Does he really think that column is not worth his time it's he's he's not good it almost reminds me of sonny corleone sonny in, in the godfather sonny was bad dude and he was he was the oldest he was uh the next in line but he was too hot-headed you know and when when column says to dougal someday you're gonna talk your head right onto a pike and that's exactly what happened to sonny in the godfather spoiler alert ew uh he didn't go on a pike but he got shot multiple times <laughs> He may be the brother, but he's not suited to be Laird. He's too feisty. He he cares about everything else except the clan. And ultimately, when you're Laird, that's what matters most. And I just I can't get behind Dougal as as uh, as as a Laird. All right, kid. What do you say we do the voicemails? Bring him up. All right, let's do it. Hey, Mary and Blake. It's uh, Cheryl from Atlanta, Georgia. It's ten oh nine. And um, please edit my message as necessary because I've had about. Eight fingerfuls of um, Glen, Glen Levitt scotch in honor of uh, this episode. But um, I saw your tweet, so I'm calling. Oh my effing god, that was a fabulous, fabulous episode. So worth the wait. And a week to wait for the next episode is now nothing compared to the months that we had to wait. So that's a positive. Um, but anyway, I thought everything was just fantastic. I thought the spanking scene. I was so curious to know how they were going to do that, and I thought they did it brilliantly. First of all, because it was Jamie's point of view, which was great, and they were able to show how the spanking or the punishing was his duty, and they just did it really well, and I liked the lighthearted music with it. I wouldn't say they made it fun, but I don't know. It was brilliant. I think they did such a great job. And that argument scene after Wentworth, holy cow, as Diana Gabaldon says, Katrina, uh, I said Claire and Katrina at the same time. Katrina Balf has the most expressive chin in the world. Love it. That scene was so intense. Those actors are so good. I mean, my husband's not the book reader, so he's like, um, he's like you, Blake. So he's just seeing this for the first time, and I really have to keep my mouth shut. Um, but um, he he loves it. He 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 wells up with tears. He gasps. He he. It's it's just. Phenomenal. Anyway, uh, politics. The whole politics thing with um, the brothers, Colm and Dougal. Uh, I think it's great. And I, I'm just so appreciative how the, how the, the, uh, Matt Roberts, I think, and, you know, the other script writers are, are, are taking the book and finding the most important parts and points of the book and expressing them in a way that a TV audience will see how important they are. Um, because the politics in the book is important, but I don't know if it's emphasized or, or magnified as much, it, as much as it is in the book as it is in the, in the show. And it needs to be in the show because you need to retain TV viewers. And they're doing such a great job. They're making such smart decisions. And they're making a smart decision with Leary, too. 
although I used to call her Laga Hair, but Leary, um, where Leary, yes, she's important in the book, but they're making her, like, uh, the main um, antagonist as far as the marriage. And um, I just think they're doing a really good job. What a little slut, though. Anyway, so it was just such a great episode. And then that scene at the end and the bite, biting vixen just, you know, the sex scene, holy cow, um, yeah, ah, speechless, ah, cold shower, holy cow, I need a cigarette. Um, anyway, so those are my thoughts. I hope I made some sense. And, Mary, I hope you're feeling better because it sounds like you're really sick. And um, I'm sorry to hear that. So I hope you're feeling better. Hi there, this is Brenda Spettler from California, and I think that the way the show is crafted with the focus on the political intrigue helps it segue for the non-readers into the upcoming episodes, and I think it's very well done. Hi, this is Keisha from Washington, D.C., an Outlander fan and a listener of Outlander cast with Mary and Blake, and I just wanted to say that I loved the intense fight. It was, it was just like breathtaking because you're seeing 20, Claire with her 20th century values and Jamie with his 18th century values, you know, a test of wills. They're both right, but Claire is wrong. <laughs> the politics, yeah, back and forth about how they played it out in the show because I'm a book reader, but it helps the show. The only the people who only see it, the show, understand backstory, which I can appreciate because um, we're not here just to please the book readers, but to please everyone. Great job, you know, as far as outlander is concerned i loved episode 9 109 i could watch it like over and over again can't wait till episode 10 really looking forward to molly brock thanks you guys mary hope you feel better hear from you soon thanks now normally we would get to all of your voicemails as soon as possible and and, and actually address them one by one but we've had so many because i actually called you guys out on (laughs) our social media and it was awesome you responded so i apologize for the fact that we're just kind of bunching them all together but i wanted to say you guys are all right and you're all so very nuanced about what the book says and what the show is saying and it's great to recognize each as their own individual entities it's fantastic and i'm so happy that the book readers themselves are accepting the show as it is in a lot of times you'll see people who read books are kind of like are, are elitist almost and that is something that is really really upsetting when that happens but luckily outlander fans rule and you guys are awesome especially about the politics and accepting the fact that it has to be gone over and in, in, in some form or fashion for guys like me or viewers like me who have not read the books and are not getting those scenes all right well, let's get on to the next batch of calls Hey, Mary. Hey, Blake. It's Stephanie um, in Pennsylvania, leaving you voicemail about Saturday's show. was awesome. <laughs> My sister and I really had no words to say to each other after it was finished. It was just jam-packed, emotional. Acting was phenomenal. Um, if they don't get any nods for this, there's something wrong with the system. Um, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the episodes this season so that's my feedback for you i'm looking forward to see where they're going to take a lot of things um and i'll make sure to contact you again talk to you later bye hi mary and blake this is annette from syracuse new york i've been listening to your podcast for quite a while now and i found you guys by listening to your um Living Reminders podcast, which I absolutely love. This is my first time calling in. Um, I just want to let you know that I absolutely love this episode. I didn't think I was going to get to watch it because I don't have stars, but I am staying at a place that has it, so I was lucky. Anyways, I um, wanted to let you know that one of my favorite parts was was a scene where um, 
he was, Jamie was going to give Claire her spanking. That was hilarious. And I also felt like my heart was going to tear out when um, they had their first real argument and Claire was yelling at him and not acting thankful. And he was just brokenhearted and not, he just couldn't understand it. But anyways, um, I'm going to keep this short. So have a good day and thank you for this podcast. I absolutely love it. Nobody I know watches the show. So this is the only way I can, you know, hear about it from other people. Thank you. Bye. All right. I just had to jump in here real quick and say, Annette, my girl, thank you so much for calling in. I love the fact that you've called in now finally and you've you've partaken in this great voicemail system. I think it's fantastic and and you've been such a long time listener. I know we've talked multiple times on social media, but I'm so happy that you've had a chance to uh, finally contact us and thank you so much. And Stephanie, yes, the episode was good, but I also felt like maybe they're just putting too much into these stories like they're they're trying to cover so much ground that they're almost inhibiting themselves from all of this they, they, they're getting the politics and the the arguments and everything it's all just coming in at once and maybe if they slow down a little bit they could they could really get involved in some of this material um but maybe that's just an affectation of the books because it is so dense and they need to fit the first book within the first season it's a hard choice to make and i think it's something that maybe we Maybe they could do, but obviously they're making the choice to get it all in in one episode. So we'll see what happens going forward. Hi, Mary and Blake. This is Lori from Indianapolis, Indiana, calling with um, some thoughts about Outlander uh, 109, The Reckoning. Um, Overall, I want to say I really loved this episode. Um, This is part of my favorite part of the book. And so seeing it come alive on the screen was really powerful for me especially with a lot of the dialogue being taken completely from the book and hearing those words. And I thought the acting was incredible with um, Katrina and Sam. So really loving that. Um, uh, The strapping or the beating never really bothered me in the book. It was just something I kind of breathed past. And I still kind of feel the same way in the show. Um, It's a little bit more disturbing seeing it, but I can breathe past it because I think it's, the justification was given in the show and that's a sign of the time. So it's something that I can kind of get over and they show the consequences in the show a little bit more than they did in the book. So I appreciated that, but, um, you know, there was really some weight to the consequences of what happened there. Um, the Leary, um, piece really kind of threw me for a loop because it's significantly different from the book, which most of the time I'm really happy with the choices that they've made when they've changed from the book. But, this is a little off for me. I'm wanting to see where it goes because a lot of things that happen coming up, not to spoil anything, um, her behavior now would impact some of those things. So I'm just interested to see how that's all going to go and how that's going to play out in the future. Um, I loved uh, also Tobias' his blackjack at the beginning scene. I thought he was super scary, and I loved uh, Jamie just, shoving his head down on that desk and knocking him out. So it was a big Yahoo moment for me. So overall, great. Glad to have you guys back doing the podcast. I'm looking forward to listening. And Mary, I hope you're feeling better because I know there's nothing worse than being sick and being pregnant at the same time. So um, best wishes to you. Thanks. Thank you so much for bringing this idea up of Leary and what she's doing and why she's doing it. And, and of course, I didn't read the book, so I don't know what is going on. But God, I you know, it just makes me feel like Leary is going to be a much bigger player in what is happening between Claire and Jamie. I wonder what she's going to do to drive a wedge between them. And I, and I think I have an outlandish theory of the week that will get along with this, but I'm going to let this one simmer a little bit. I'm going to let it marinate. I'm going to see what happens with it. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to be a much bigger deal than I think a lot of the show watchers are probably, it's, it's not just like, Oh, it's soap opera. Mm, Larry, she's here and she's just going to throw, you know, a wrench into the fire. No, I think it's something that is going to be a lot bigger than that. We'll see what happens. Hi, this is Denise from Ohio, and I was just calling about episode 109, The Reckoning. First of all, I love, love, love listening to you guys, and I cannot wait to hear your next podcast. Um, As far as Reckoning, I love that it's from Jamie's point of view. They had so much to cover, I wish they could have made it two hours. 
but it was a great show. Number one, Jack Randall. Oh, my gosh, just what a creep is he. Um, I loved the fight by the stream when they were in each other's faces. That was just such a powerful scene. And then uh, the spanking, it really didn't bother me in the book. I thought they made it kind of comical um, in the show, and it kind of got the point across without being too abrupt. Um, when they got to the castle, I was surprised by Colin's reaction to Jamie marrying a Sassanuk and how he could now not succeed him. And Leary, ooh, what can we say about Leary, but she's just ooh. And my favorite part was when Jamie made his pledge to Claire, and then she puts a knife to his throat. And absolutely my least favorite part was the ending when he says, Leary, it was like a soap opera ending. But all in all, I love the show. I can't wait to see the next one. And love you guys. Keep up the great work. And Mary, hope you're feeling better. Bye. Hey guys, this is Kendra from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I'm just calling in in regards to uh, the most recent episode, first episode back, and I'm sure that everybody uh, is kind of um, addressing this, but I just wanted to add my two cents in, because I found both the the scene itself and also um, the reaction to it that I've seen kind of across the board on social media um, to be a little bit disturbing, um, and of course, this is the strapping scene. Um, I read the books, um, I read the first one about 15 years ago, and I remember being slightly bothered by that scene to begin with, um, but I kind of pushed it aside, and in fact, Diana herself kind of pushes it aside in, in the subsequent book, she kind of pretends it didn't happen, um, but I guess looking forward to it, I mean, this has been such a strong show overall, um, I kind of had high hopes that Ron Moore would take it and kind of turn it on, turn it on its head and take the violence out of it. Um, instead, um, he, you know, sets it to a lively tune and then cuts back and forth between the room upstairs and, you know, the guy is making jokes about it downstairs. And I found that really, really disturbing. I mean, because what is, what is happening, um, not just in our modern society, but in the the world of 1743, historically speaking, it still would have been frowned upon. It still would have been domestic violence. And so this is happening, and we're getting this jaunty tune, and, uh, you know, we get this sly little smirk from Jamie right at the end um, when he starts to whip her. And um, I, I found it really upsetting. Um, and I'm, I'm actually still kind of riled about it. Um, I am, I'm up to the fourth book and without, um, giving any spoilers away, um, there is a heavy theme of violence against women, not just violence, but sexual violence against women that plays through all of the books. Um, and it, it's disturbing, um, because it's, you can you choose your world when you're creating a story. You choose your world when you choose what happens in that world. And to choose a world where basically no one is safe and and for the most part the the women that you have created, um, you know, none of them are safe from this kind of violence. Uh it's it's disturbing. And, um, you know, honestly, I don't think I'm going to read past the fourth book. But um, but what I wanted to say about the reaction on social social media is that people seemed far more outraged um, with Leary being depicted as, um, you know, coming on to Jamie and showing Jamie actually for a moment tempted. I mean, here he is, um, and he has just been, you know, kind of speaking about um, in voiceover about how he has this rift from Claire and he doesn't know if it can be fixed. Um, of course, in presented with that kind of temptation, any man is going to at least think about it, um, you know. But the, the one valiant thing he did in this episode was walking away from her. And the the reaction on Twitter was that just him showing a slight, you know, modicum of temptation um, in that scene was far more um, villainous 
than him taking a belt to his wife. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what that says about us as a society, um, that we're so willing to forgive that kind of behavior as long as the guy is dreamy. Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of my takeaway from it. Overall, I thought the episode um, was strong, but not um, – not as strong, and again, I was disappointed um, with the, the treatment of that scene. Um, he, they had the opportunity to kind of really take um, take the sting out of it, and um, and they chose not to. And and I am disappointed. I'll, I'll watch the the rest of the show um, because I do know what's coming up, but um, I, I am a little disappointed with this episode. Thanks. Bye. I am amazed, really amazed at the difference and interpretation of all of these scenes between listeners and readers and, and watchers, and everybody has a good good and valid opinion of what is happening. Uh, some people are very disappointed, some people are disgusted, some people laugh about it, some people put it aside. It is so very, very different, and I love every bit of it. Thank you guys so much for coming in and, and, and really saying all the well wishes for Mary. She, she, I know she really appreciates it. All right, everybody. Thank you for calling in. Great feedback. Love it. All right. Let's get this week's Tweet of the Week. At Toka Marimba. Ooh, nice said, name. I know. I love Marimbas. Said, just watched the season premiere of Outlander, and now I want to have sex with everything. Hashtag, damn, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you make me read that? <laughs> because I had to. Oh, oh. Congratulations, Toka Marimba. You are this week's Tweet of the Week. Oh, man, that was good stuff. That was. Now, Blake, you have Outlandish Theories of the Week, and you said you actually have two. I got two really good Outlandish Theories of the Week. You want to hear it? Go for it. All right, let's do it. All right, the first one I got is this. After rewatching The Wedding in Both Sides Now from season 1A, I came away with two very specific things, both with huge f- foreshadowing. Okay, first, in The Wedding, Jamie says to, I think, Dougal, he says, I only plan on marrying once. And then the next thing that comes from Both Sides Now is Mrs. Graham says to Frank that travelers always come back. Okay? Right. Great. Awesome. Claire is going back to Frank in the 40s, somehow, some way. I don't know how it's going to happen. Whether it's her choice or not, I have yet to decide. But she's going back to the 40s. She's going to come back. Of course, then she realizes when she does get back that probably, like for a number of different reasons, my the one main reason is she probably realizes that Frank isn't the one that's for her. She realizes that Jamie is the one that's for her. She needs to continue her life with him. She misses Jamie. Frank just doesn't have it. So she tries to get back to Scotland. And somehow, some way, maybe she gets back to Craig Nadoon and she gets back to Scotland. Problem is, she's going to come back and it's going to be like way in the future for 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 Jamie and it's going to be like maybe 10 15 years in the future and he's going to be remarried Aww. and her heart's going to be broken Aww. and Jamie probably thinks that she's dead or she's gone the same exact thing that happened to Frank oh Claire ran off with another dude or Claire got did got killed or whatever now the same exact thing is going to happen and Claire is going to have to deal with this and she is not going to know what happened i think that's the first big outlandish theory of the week that I have for this season. Whether or not that happens this season, I don't know. But the big one I got is this. The big, big, big outlandish theory of the week. As a matter of fact, it's so big. It is so freaking big. I'm going to play the sound again. Here we go. Ready? The big one is that column later on this season. I guarantee this at the end of this season he is going to give jamie up to black jack randall because he has to answer for what happened at fort william and he has to make things right with bjr in the english he doesn't want to have this jacobite rebellion he doesn't want to have to deal with bjr and all the things happen he's responsible for the clan he has to keep his clan safe and if BJR comes up to him and says, listen, all debts are forgiven, all this crap, all the issues that go on, 
are forgiven. As long as you give me Jamie, I need Jamie. And I guarantee you, I'm putting my freaking house on it, that Colum is the one that gives Jamie up at the end of the season. And Jamie is in BJR's hands. You know what I'm going to say to that? What? Interesting. Yeah. You know what that is? Bam! Just like that. A winner! Yeah, that's right. A winner. That's me. You just put our house on the line. <laughs> oh, God, that feels good, doesn't it? Let's just close out the show. I, I'm sick of biting my tongue. Oh, God, that feels good to get that out. Like, it was a big weight off. I was waiting all episode to say that. Well, I'm proud of you. All right. Whew. All right, let's close up. I'm Whew. shaking my, my head. My heart's pumping right now. That was so good. Like, I, I, I just, I, I hit a swish. I'm just going to leave my hand up there, just like that. Oh, that felt oh, good. Oh, you non-book reader. Oh, man, that was so good. All right, let's close out the show. Okay. Thank you, everyone, so incredibly much for listening to our newest episode of Outlander Cast. We love to interact with you and chat with you. Once again, please remember that Blake is spoiler free if you didn't pick that up from what he just said. Um, (laughs) When you reach out to us on our social media outlets, they are all Outlander Cast. So that's Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can reach us at outlandercast.com. And check out all of our cool stuff there, as well as all of our episodes and all of our sponsors. Please be kind to them, especially Don at Tag Your It. And then while you're on the website, you can also check out the Mary and Blake store. There's the Sassanok Wasted shirt and more. And she was not Sassanok Wasted at all this episode. No, she listening. wasn't. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because we were watching, rewatching the wedding episode and we noticed how much whiskey that girl actually consumed. Huge cupfuls, one after the other. If that were me... I wouldn't even be able to form words. I'd be dead. You barely could at the end of our wedding. <laughs> and you didn't even have nearly as much whiskey. Oh, my God. I love you so much, baby. If you would like to send us an email, our email address. This is what I say. I say this. Too bad. No, no, no. I'm going with it. You have to go to... Del- you have to <laughs> You're email. doing now. I can't even say it now. I'm so flustered. Over my over my awesome Outlandish Theory of the Week. Go to outlandercast at gmail.com. You can also call the hotline. This is how we can hear your voice here on OutlanderCast. Our phone number is 503-454-6730. And you can also see that on OutlanderCast.com. And we also want to remind you guys that this episode of OutlanderCast is brought to you by the Tag Your It Etsy shop. Whether it's an Outlander-inspired piece of jewelry for your favorite Sassanok or just an original jewelry recreation designed by Dawn, the owner, you can find something there for anyone so please 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 for the love of god please take the time to visit don at www.tagurit.biz b-i-z biz tag your mama tag your pet tag your it whatever it is thank you so much everyone if you enjoyed this episode find us on itunes and feel free to give us a rating and a review we really really appreciate them they make us so happy And thank you for putting up with my sick voice. I won't be sick next time, I promise. I hope not. If I am, (coughs) I I might need Claire. (coughs) Sorry, guys. Sorry. It's real life. I know. Real life. All right, guys. I'm Mary. My name's Blake. And you've been listening to Outlander Cast.